we are back in the book of Exodus, in Exodus chapter 6 this morning. We're only going to look at three verses. We're not really going to make a lot of progress through this, but uh, these are, I think, three key verses that will really encourage us this morning. We've gone through, uh, you know, talking about freedom from bondage, uh, experiencing the deliverance that God has for his people. And we've seen the promises that God has made to Moses over and over again so far just in the first few chapters. Well, we're going to see seven promises and three verses that God makes to Moses, and we'll see how they can apply to our lives this morning. So we're going to be talking this morning about being delivered by an outstretched arm. Uh, We'll see that in these verses this morning. I was reading in the book of Psalms yesterday, uh, one of my reading plans, I read... I skip ahead 30 chapters, so I take whatever day of the week it is. Yesterday was the 16th, so I read Psalm 16 and Psalm 46. Jump on through. You get Psalm 106, and Psalm 106 details what Exodus 6 talks about. And then I jumped over to Psalm 136, and Psalm 136 also talks about these same exact verses. So it's just kind of neat to see uh, how the people of Israel, uh, centuries later, were still praising God for the promises that he made in the verses that we're going to look at this morning. Uh, how many of you have ever wished that you could take a vacation from your problems? I just, yeah, we got a couple honest people in here this morning. Uh, you know, you could drive, just get in the car and drive and get away from all your financial problems. Uh, jump on a plane, fly to the other side of the world, and get away from all of your problems that have to do with your job. Just get away from your problems. Take a vacation from them. And that sounds like a great idea. But you know what happens when we come back from vacation? You know what's still waiting on us when we get back from it? All the problems that we left behind. You can kind of escape them maybe for a few days, but when you come back, uh, problems don't take vacations. They're still waiting on us. And so from a human standpoint, Moses' first attempt to deliver God's message to Pharaoh, we saw that last week in chapter 5, it wasn't... It didn't go over very good, did it? Um, it, was, it was really just a failure. If you want to just look at it, it was a failure. He went and gave Pharaoh God's message, let my people go, and it didn't work. But from God's standpoint, he already knew what was going to happen, didn't he? He knew that when Moses went before Pharaoh and delivered that message to him, God already knew that Pharaoh was going to reject that message. And God already knew what he would do when Pharaoh rejected that message. And so what seemed to be a failure from Moses' viewpoint, it was all part of God's plan for their deliverance. And in our lives, when we feel like we have problems and we feel like we've failed and we have, we're having issues, what seems like failures and problems from our viewpoint... God already knew about them. And so from his viewpoint, that's just part of his plan. And so when Moses and Aaron, they go to Pharaoh, they request the freedom of the Israelite people, they went with a faith-filled request. I mean, they went with faith that God was going to answer what they've been praying about, and so they go in faith with this message. And instead, their faith-filled message kind of gets rejected in a hateful way. I like what Rod Mattoon said about their first appointment uh, with Pharaoh. He said, matters got, worse for Pharaoh, uh, uh, matters got worse for Moses and the Israelites in Egypt. He said, Pharaoh got meaner, provisions got leaner. You remember he took away the straw that they were going to make a uh, brick with? So Pharaoh gets meaner, the provisions get leaner, and he says the prophet Moses, his complaints got keener. Uh, I mean, he, he really begins just kind of questioning God and, and are you sure that you know what you're doing, God? Are you sure that you sent the right person? Well, God's going to encourage Moses once again. He kind of has to keep building Moses up. I mean, Moses kind of gets on fire for God for a little while. He's got a, a heart full of faith and he's ready to go forward. And then, man, problems happen and the wind kind of gets knocked out of his sails and he feels like he takes a step back. And so here comes God again to encourage and lift him up. Have you ever been where Moses was at? I mean, I feel like we should be able to identify with Moses. Problems will kind of knock us down and and make us feel deflated and take the wind out of our sails and we take a step back. 
And so we kind of need what God's going to do to Moses. And he says, Moses, I want you to see what I'm going to do. He says, I've established and remembered my covenants. Uh, I've heard their groaning. I've seen what's going on. And we talked about that a couple weeks ago, that he's a God who sees, he's a God who hears, he's a God who cares. Uh, Norm on Wednesday night, uh, he, he went through some of the names of God. And it's a wonderful and encouraging study when you go through and you learn the different names of God. And it helps us to understand that we have a God who sees. The God who sees everything. A, a God who hears everything. A God who not just sees and hears, but he's a God who actually gets involved in our lives. And as you begin to study all the different names of God, it really begins to bless your heart. And and God's trying to work in Moses' life, and he begins by revealing his name to him. Remember, he told him back in Exodus chapter 3, I am that I am. It's the name Yahweh, God. And so he tells Moses, uh, the impossible is going to become possible. And so he indicates this truth to Moses In these next three verses, Exodus chapter 6, verse 6, 7, and 8, by seven I will statements. I want you to see them with me as we go through here. Verse number 6. This is God talking to Moses. Wherefore say unto the children of Israel, I am the Lord. Here's the first one. And I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Here's the second one. I will rid you out of their bondage. Here's the third one. I will redeem you with a stretched out arm and with great judgments. Here's the fourth one. I will take you to me for a people. Here's the fifth one. I will be to you a God. And ye shall know that I am the Lord your God, which bringeth you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Here's number six. I will bring you into a land concerning the which I did swear to give it to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Here's the seventh one. I will give it to you for an heritage I am the Lord. Uh, Throughout these three verses, through these seven I will promises, God reminds Moses, God reminds Aaron, God reminds the people of Israel that he is still Jehovah God. He's the I am God. He's the all-seeing God. He's the all-knowing God. He's the all-powerful God. He's the all-sufficient God. And he makes these promises, I will do this. He's going to deliver his people by his stretched out arm. And he promises to deliver. And God's always faithful to his promises, isn't he? We can count on the promises of God. They're true. They're sure. And so God wanted his people to understand that the answer to all of their problems was found in him. And it's the same thing in your life. The answer to every one of your problems is found in the same God that delivered the people of Israel out of their bondage in Egypt. He's the same God who sees your problems. He's the same God that knows when you feel like you failed. He's the same God who wants to offer deliverance to you. And the answer to everything you need in life is still found in Him. Every single aspect of the salvation of the Israelites from bondage It didn't depend on their ability. It didn't depend on Moses or Aaron's ability. Every single aspect of their salvation, you know what it depended on? It depended on God's character and who he was. Same way in our life. It's not through our own strength. It's not through our own trying. You'll feel like you're just spinning your wheels when you're trying to do it that way. The salvation for the Israelites from their bondage, their freedom, it all began with God's grace and it would all end with giving glory back to him. In your life, our salvation that God gave to us, our spiritual salvation, our spiritual freedom from bondage, it all began with God's grace and it all ends with returning glory back to him. You see... All these pictures we find through the book of Exodus, how it takes us back uh, to the cross and reminds us what God has done for us. And so whatever difficulties showed up in the meantime, uh, God would be able to handle them because he was the Lord. He was the all-powerful God. Uh, He's already shown Moses 
that he's more powerful than the gods of Egypt, and he's going to show Pharaoh and the Egyptian people that he's more powerful than any of the gods of Egypt. And so rather than taking a vacation from our problems, rather than Moses taking a vacation from his problems, because Pharaoh was still going to be there. Uh, Moses could go away and he could, you know, do some R&R for a couple weeks, but when he came back, you know what he's going to find? Pharaoh was still there and the people of Israel were still in bondage. And you can take a vacation from your problems, but when you come back, you're still going to find that they're still there. And so rather than taking a vacation, what we got to do is find rest in God. Psalm chapter 46, verse number 1. Uh, he's our refuge and our strength and a very present help in time of trouble. That's where we find our rest at. Uh, he's the answer to every difficulty. And you know, maybe that's why God allowed Moses to have that failure the first time. Because what if Moses would have gone into Pharaoh the very first time and said, uh, let my people go. God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, oh, okay, we'll do that. Moses might have got a little bit prideful about it. And the people of Israel might have elevated Moses to a higher status. And he would have gotten the credit for doing all this instead of God. But now Moses goes in and Moses has failed. And so Moses knows, I can't do it. And the people of Israel, they look at Moses and like, you're no deliverer. You're not getting us out of here. So now when they actually get delivered, who's going to get the credit for it? God. The credit that he deserves. And so God's made them some promises. And we know God's faithful to his promises. The Bible tells us in the book of Numbers that, that God is not a man that he should lie. Uh, he says that, that he'll make good on his promises every single time. You can take the word of God. That's why it's important to, to read the word of God and to, and to have that daily relationship with him because that's how you find the promises of God. That's how you know that God's going to come through. When, if you don't know what he's promised, it's kind of hard to know that he'll follow through on it. But he's made us those promises. And so Moses was learning how to trust the Lord in the face of difficulty, in the face of failure. And so God comes to reassure Moses with these promises that we see in these verses this morning. And they're helpful for us all today uh, as we think about the deliverance of God. Keep in mind what we said when we first began this series, that Exodus is a God-centered book. Uh, it has a God-centered message that teaches us to have a God-centered life. That's what God was trying to teach Moses and the people of Israel. And that's what we get from the book of, Moses, uh, from the book of Exodus when we come to it, that it's all God-centered. The most important thing we need to know is who God is. When we know who he is, when we know those names of God, El Shaddai, all those different things, he can begin to minister to us. So the first thing that he tells Moses is about a redemption that he has for them. Israel was discouraged because their workload had suddenly increased. Pharaoh got meaner and the provisions got leaner. Remember that? The straw has been taken away. So the people of Israel are discouraged. This is getting tougher. And so they've kind of plunged into despair and anxiety. You ever been there? Amen. You ever dealt with despair and anxiety in your life, stress? That's the people of Israel. And so they wonder if their situation is ever going, to be, uh, ever going to become better, if it's ever going to improve. They began to have a little doubt in their spirits. I think we've been there before. If you haven't, you probably will be. And so God came and he delivers this promise of redemption to his people. And even though the situation had gotten worse for the people of Israel at this time, God still cared about his people. God still saw what they were going through. God still knew what they were going through. God still had a plan for their deliverance. Even though the situation got worse at the moment, God was still in control of every single aspect of it. God knows no impossibilities. And so his promise of redemption, it wasn't just some impossible dream. When God promised to redeem them, we know that it's going to happen. So let's look at the, pro uh, the provision of deliverance. Uh, he assures his people he'll bring them out of bondage. And even though Pharaoh refused to do what God told him to do, that didn't change what God 
was planning to do. Verse number 6, God says, I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And God always keeps his promises, doesn't he? He's always faithful. Have you ever had someone make a promise to you and then not keep it? That'll happen to you. Uh, I heard about the man who he needed some same-day dry cleaning done, so he went into the cleaner called One Hour Dry Cleaners, and he brought in a suit, filled out the tag, and he told the lady at the front desk he'd be back in an hour to pick it up. She said, uh, man, we can't get that back to you for two days. And he said, I thought you did dry cleaning in an hour. She said, no, 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 no. That's, uh, that's just the name of the store. Sometimes we'll see things that look like a promise, and then it doesn't get delivered on. Uh, people will tell us one thing and do something else. But God doesn't deal in those kind of human inconsistencies, does he? When God makes a promise, he keeps it. What God says always comes to pass. We can always trust his word. And so he promised the people of Israel, I'll bring you out from under the burdens of, Egypt, of the Egyptians. Uh, he says, I'll give you rest. God promised rest to his people. And you know, one of the consequences of, of living in sin, which is a picture of Egypt living in the world, one of the consequences of sin is a loss of rest and peace in your life. And God offers to give us deliverance from that. He wants to give us freedom from that bondage of sin. The reality of sin, uh, Rod Mattoon, again, he said, sin leaves us famished, flustered, floundering, and frustrated. That's what sin will do to you. When when you find yourself living in uh, spiritual Egypt, in the world, you'll, you'll experience being flustered, being frustrated. The prophet Isaiah, he told us, the wicked are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, whose waters cast up mire and dirt. But God's telling the people of Israel, I have rest for you. I'll bring you out from the burdens of Egypt. And so thank God for his deliverance that he gives to us from sin. Uh, The Lord's still delivering people from those burdens today. For thousands of years, that's what God has done. Uh, He delivers from the burdens of sin. He delivers from the judgment of hell when we put our faith in Christ. And so when we come to Christ for forgiveness of sin, he gives us rest. What does the book of Hebrews tell us? There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. If you find yourself anxious, worried, That's not what God intends for you to have in your life. There's supposed to be rest and peace in the life of those who are the children of God. That's what he wants for you. What did Jesus tell us in the book of Matthew? Come unto me, all that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So God calls us to come to him so we can experience that deliverance and the the, the fulfillment of his promise for rest. So there was the provision of deliverance, and then we see the provision of freedom. He promised to completely rid them from the bondage of the Egyptians. The next part of verse number 6 says, I will rid you out of their bondage. He says, I'll give you rest, and I'll rid you. Out of their bondage. What does the word rid mean? Well, it means to pluck out of the hands of an oppressor or enemy. To snatch from danger. You could say that it means to rescue. It means to free. It means to give liberty to the one that was bound and in bondage. God says, that's what I'm going to do for you, Moses. That's what I'm going to do for you, Israel. They're going to be free from their Egyptian bondage soon. They're going to be rescued from their slavery. They're going to be rescued from the oppression that they've been under for hundreds of years there in Egypt. God says, I'm going to rid you of that. I'm going to free you from it. And just as the Israelites were under great bondage to Pharaoh, 
many people in our world are in bondage to sin. Before you came to Christ, that's how you were. You were in bondage to sin. But God promises a way to get freedom from the grips of sin. There's a handout in your paper uh, that you have this morning. I'd encourage you to take that home and just kind of think on that. Meditate it through during this week. There's a question there that says, what are some of the areas of freedom and growth you've seen in your life since you were saved? This is a good devotional thought this week. It, it, it will lead you to a closer relationship with God to get back and think about how your life has changed since God delivered you from sin. Because there should be some things that he's delivered you from. There should be some things that are, that are different in your life because you're no longer a slave to sin. And so think about that. Think about how you've grown. Begin to praise God for his deliverance in your life. Romans 8, chapter 1 tells us, There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh but after the Spirit, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. You're free from the power of sin in your life. God set those chains. He's loosed those chains of bondage in your life. Begin to praise him for that. Think about what he's done in your life. And so the, the world is under the law of sin and death, but we see a beautiful picture of Jesus providing Freedom for those who come to him for forgiveness of sin, who come to Christ for salvation by his grace. Sin is a hard taskmaster. But our God who delivers us can rid us of that problem once and for all. That's freedom. And God sees our worth and our value even when we don't. There are times where even after you come to Christ, you'll still feel like you're worthless. You'll still think about, man, this is what I used to be. Don't get so weighed down in, in what you used to be before you came to know Christ. I've known people that it was like they came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. And they put all that weight of sin and bondage down when they got saved. They, they put it there at the foot of the cross. They come to Christ for forgiveness and salvation. And when they're finished, they pick it all right back up and start carrying it with them again. And I, I, think of the, I think of the book Pilgrim's Progress. You remember when, when he came to know Christ as Savior? You, you remember that heavy weight that rolled off of his back? That's how it is. God looks ahead even right now in your life. There, there, there's growth in your life, even if you don't see it. Begin to look and see, man, I may not be everything God wants me to be. But begin to look at where you used to be and say, man, there's been some growth in my life. And when God looks at you, he sees ahead to the finished product. In the book of Philippians, Paul tells us, being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Christ Jesus. You see, God sees what your full potential is. God, God intends for you to continue growing, for you to continue maturing. That's what God wants. God promises to deliver us when we ask him to. And he gave a promise of deliverance to the children of Israel, and they could count on this promise. Why? Because they could count on God. Yep. You can count on Him in your life, just like they could. And then we see the provision of redemption. And the final part of this promise uh, is a declaration of, of coming redemption made possible by the outstretched arm of God. Back in verse 6, he says, I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. Our reach is limited. Our reach is limited. There's only so much that we can do as, as humans. But God's reach is not. God can reach anywhere. God can do anything. No matter how dis, uh, de desperate your situation is, God has the ability to stretch out his arm and begin to change things for you. God can reach down and pick you up and bring you out to redemption. And that was his promise to the children of Israel. It doesn't matter where you live, what you've done, how deep of a hole you think that you're in. God's strong enough and powerful enough and his reach is far enough that he can lift you up like the psalmist says. 
out of the miry clay and set you on a solid rock. His reach is unlimited. His arm is stretched out for you, just like it was for the children of Israel. So many people today think, you know, God just doesn't ever do anything for me. God's not, uh, God's kind of against me. The book of Psalms says God is for us. When you're his child, God's for you. He's not up there, you know, with like a stick waiting to hit you over the head with it. Uh, God's your father and he loves you. He's the example of what a, a perfect father is. And so his arm is stretched out waiting to help you. And the word redeem, he says, I will redeem you. That word redeem is talking about what is known as a kinsman redeemer. And if you go to the book of Ruth, you find really the best picture of what a kinsman redeemer is uh, in the life of uh, Ruth after her husband had died. A man by the name of Boaz purchased Ruth. Ruth chapter 4 verse number 13 tells us, So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And he went in unto her, and the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. The women said unto Naomi, Blessed be the Lord, which hath not left thee this day without a kinsman, that his name may be famous in Israel. Back in Bible times, in order for a slave to be freed, there was a price that had to be paid. And it was usually a relative. They had to give a ransom, uh, and then freedom was granted. And, and this man, Boaz, fulfilled the role of this redeemer, this kinsman redeemer for Ruth. And there's a picture that we can see in our lives because spiritually we need a kinsman redeemer because we are slaves to sin. We are in bondage. And so every single one of us either is or has been in this spiritual slavery. And even though we are spiritual slaves to sin, Jesus chose to be our kinsman redeemer to come and to purchase us and to pay that price that was necessary to set that slave free. And I was reading through a book this week that talked about some of those qualifications that are required as a redeemer and how Jesus fulfilled those qualifications these are five things. I'll just quickly give them to you this morning, but I found this to be a real blessing to me. I hope it is to you. Number one, the Redeemer had to be related to the individual. And Jesus, he's related to us. Why? Well, because he wasn't just God. He was also man. He came to earth. John chapter 1, verse number 14, the Word was made flesh. And so Jesus came and... As the God-man, God in human flesh, he was fully God but fully man. So he's related to mankind. Number two, the Redeemer had to be free. We're all sinners. So it wouldn't do much good for you to try to free me from my sin. Because you're just as bound as I am. But Jesus, as the God-man was sinless. He was free of our fallen human nature. The Redeemer had to pay the price of redemption. And it was Jesus Christ alone by His sinless, perfect life that He paid the price of our salvation. And not only did the Redeemer had to have to pay the price of redemption, He had to be willing to pay the price. And it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus demonstrated his willingness to do the Father's will. Not my will, but thy will be done. And he said, I'll go to the cross and I'll pay the price for their redemption. And then the Redeemer had to be willing to marry the widow, as we saw Boaz married Ruth. You know, when we come to Christ in salvation, the Bible tells us that Jesus Christ sees the church as his bride. You become part of the bride of Christ. And Jesus says, I'm married to the church. 
Again, Exodus is a God-centered book with a God-centered message that points us all the way to the cross to what Jesus was going to do. You just look at that one word where he says, I will redeem you. Wow. You just read a section of a verse, and you could spend an entire, an entire day just meditating on that and thanking God for the fact that he'll redeem us. Mark 10, 45, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and give his life a ransom for many. Jesus came and he redeemed us the same way that he told Israel, I'll redeem you out of the bondage of slavery. God's redeemed us from the bondage of slavery of sin. And Jesus came so we could receive this powerful promise of redemption. And he stretched out his powerful arms as he let the Roman soldiers drive those spikes to his hands and his wrists, his feet. Wow, you see that picture with the stretched out arm? Isn't that kind of cool how we can see the correlation between that? And he's still offering his arm to people around us. And we have the opportunity to be an extension of that arm as we tell people, hey, come to Jesus. God allows us to be part of that outstretched arm. We get to be a part of God's redemption plan for mankind as we fulfill the great commission to, to share the gospel with those around us. We get to be a part of, of seeing people freed from slavery, of sin. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse number 17. Ah, oh Lord God, behold, thou hast made the heaven and the earth by thy great power and stretched out arm, and there is nothing too hard for thee. Hasn't it been amazing this week to see some of those new pictures coming out that NASA's put out, seeing the deepest into space that we've seen? God stretched out arm, put all of that out there. And again, I always go back to the thought, and you go back to the creation story. It's like the planets and the stars and everything out there. It's almost like it was an afterthought. You go back and read it, it says he created the stars also. Like he just kind of, oh, yeah, let's, let's do that too. Is anything too hard for God? No, it's not. And then verse 21 tells us, And has brought forth thy people Israel out of the land of Egypt with signs and with wonders, and with a strong hand and with a stretched out arm. And you'll find that same word in Psalm 106, and you'll find that same word in Psalm 136. God's stretched out arm. And it's the same God that has the stretched out arm that redeemed Egypt, that pulled them out of the slavery of, Israel, uh, of Egypt, that redeems us. That's a redemption number two we see a relationship. When God planned to redeem Israel, we've said this multiple times, it wasn't just a physical salvation that God was giving to them. That's not what his ultimate purpose was. It included that. But God's ultimate goal and his ultimate purpose for his plan of redemption was so he could have a relationship with his people. Because we have a personal God. We have a God that wants to have a relationship with us. The Egyptian gods, they were, they were kind of unreachable. They were unknowable. They didn't have personalities. They didn't want relationships with their people. They were to be feared. But our God wants a relationship with us. Even though... At this point, mankind's already fallen. Mankind's already rebelled. Mankind's already disobeyed. But God still wanted to have a relationship with those people. And he still wants to have a relationship with you. Yeah. With his chosen people. They, he wanted his chosen people to truly know who he was. He wanted them to go deeper in their relationship with him. That's his desire for you today. You see, God doesn't redeem to a religion. He redeems to a relationship. Religion is kind of cold. Religion is kind of uh, austere. A relationship's different. There's people in the world who are religious. They're doing things. They're doing works. 
That's not a relationship. First, we see a gracious choice. God loved Israel so much that he said, I'll take you. Verse number 7, I will take you to me for a people. Think about that. Think about the, the amazing love and the grace that God was showing when he chose them. It, it's almost kind of like when a bride and groom exchange vows. And there's that question, you know, uh, to the groom, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded wife? And what are the words that the groom says back? Have, have all the guys forgotten what they said? What is it? I do. Uh, the groom is promising love and commitment, and he's choosing this woman to be his. And the choice of the relationship between God and his people is kind of similar to wedding vows. God's saying, I choose you. And God chooses the children of Israel because of his grace. It, he didn't choose Israel because um, they were deserving. He didn't choose Israel because of how great they were. He chose Israel because of his great compassion and his great love. And God was going to hold his people close, uh, just like a husband would embrace his wife. And he would, he would take them out of the hands of the Egyptians. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse number 6. For thou art an holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you, nor choose you, because ye were more in number than any people, for ye were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen from the hand of Pharaoh and the king of Egypt. You know, God's compassion, God's love toward us today, it's the same as it was toward Israel. God doesn't choose us because we're so deserving, because we're so loving. We're not saved because we deserve it. It's because of his grace and his love and his mercy, and his compassion that God loved the world so much that he gave. John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And in Christ, as believers... We are his peculiar people. We're to be set apart to him. We're accepted even though we're unworthy. God still chooses to love us and to show us grace and compassion. Sometimes we may wonder if we're worthy of God's love, but God's love, it's not based on our worthiness. It's not based on our merit. It's based on his. His love is unconditional. And that's why the Bible says that we can cast all our care on him. 1 Peter 5, 7. Because he cares for us. He chose us for a relationship. He's not a God that we can't approach. He's a God who invites us to come into him. He says, come boldly before the throne of grace. Spend time in a relationship with God. I would encourage you to think of some Bible verses. Find some that, that talk about God's loving choice to have a relationship with us. Look through those promises that says that, that he, he wants to know us. He wants us to know Him. He's a, 
He's a personal God. He wants more than you just coming to church on Sunday morning. He, he He wants to hear from you Monday through Saturday as well. He, he, he wants you to get to know more about him. He wants to hear from you. He wants you to talk to him. As Christians, the average Christian struggles to pray for seven minutes. I was reading a book just a few weeks ago about prayer. It said from the surveys that they've taken, Christians find it hard to pray for seven minutes. Have you ever found it difficult to try to pray? I mean, I have. I'm honest enough to say, yeah, sometimes it's like, I don't know what else I need to say. Sometimes I just feel like I'm kind of repeating. You ever caught yourself where your mind just kind of, you start to pray and then your mind just kind of wanders and goes to different places. God wants us to do more. God wants to hear from you for more than seven minutes in a day. And from what I read, seven minutes is on the high side for Christians to pray in a day. But imagine somebody that you were in a really deep, meaningful relationship with that you talked to for seven minutes or less a day. Do you think that you build a deep, meaningful relationship in that much time? That's kind of hard. God wants more from us because he wants to have a relationship with us. A woman had two children. They were hard to handle. And so it was a really frustrating day. And her husband, he comes in from working in the yard. And she says, you know what? I've decided to sell the kids. This was Noel. She told Joey this. And he looked at her and he said, you're crazy. She said, why, for wanting to sell them? He said, no, you're crazy for thinking anybody would buy them. (laughs) But we're chosen by God, not for our worth. Hey, nobody would want to buy us. Nobody but God would want to redeem us, would want to have a relationship with us. I mean, we sin, we disobey him, we cause all sorts of problems for him. And yet, God still wants a relationship with us. Isn't that incredible? And he did for the people of Israel too. So we're not chosen by God because of our worth. We're chosen by him because of his love. Book of 1 John. We love him because he first loved us. We're not going to get through the rest of this this morning, so we'll come back. Uh, Joey's teaching in here next Sunday morning, so we'll pick it up in two weeks. We may have to do a little refresher on, on this, but it's only three verses. But I was so moved by these three verses. There's a lot there that we can get from it. We're not, we're not through it yet. But this week, take that, take that paper. Meditate on some of those questions this week. Think about what God's done in your life and, and move to a deeper relationship with him. God, thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word this morning. Thank you for being a God who who has a stretched out arm, who's powerful enough to to redeem us. Thank you for for being willing to redeem us and to pay the price that was required. Lord, we pray that you would work in our hearts this morning through the music and through the preaching. God, I pray that we are, are ready to worship you this morning because of your great love and because of what you've done in our lives, because of the deliverance that you've given to us from the bondage of sin. Lord, I pray that you would just work in our hearts and and help us to express our love to you this morning in a meaningful way. God, I pray that we would offer up the, the fruit of our lips as a sacrifice of praise this morning for all that you've done in our lives. We praise you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen.